Okay, Ken, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I think that's the first time I've been there compared with Madonna, hopefully the last time as well. Um, when Ken asked me to do this, the obvious challenge that occurs to you very quickly is how do you take a subject this vast and condense it into 25 minutes? Um, so interestingly, to pick up on, a, on something he's already said, what I'd like you to think about this morning is this as a sort of a taster menu. Okay, so the five or six things I'm going to mention, any of them would comfortably fill a one-day workshop. Uh, but for the purposes of what you can achieve in 25 minutes, I just want to give you some insights, which hopefully, if I do my job properly, will cause you to go away and reflect, to think, discuss, and maybe even you know, rethink some of the things that you're currently doing. Talent management makes absolutely no sense unless it's in the context of what your business is doing. The fact of the matter is, however, a lot of people write talent management strategies which could actually belong to any business, any industry. So before we get on to specifically talent management, what I want to do is set the scene. I don't think too many people would argue that if these are not literally the four biggest challenges, they'd probably feature in the top five. Change is not just change these days, it's constant change. Those people who study this will tell you that not only is the speed of change increasing, but its complexity is changing as well which is why paradigm shifts, which I'll come on to in a moment, are becoming an increasing feature of uh, how change manifests itself. And for those of you who are not sure what a paradigm shift is, basically it changes the, all the rules of the game. Okay, so if you happen to be the corporate leader at that stage, a paradigm shift change can literally wipe you out. I'll show you some examples. And uncertainty and complexity, let me try and illustrate that. Four simple questions. Who's going to win the next US presidency election? Is Greece going to be in the European Union in the next 12 months? How's the world going to deal with ISIS in the next three years? And if we get Ebola under control, is there going to be another pandemic in West Africa in the next three years? Okay. There is a theme running through those. If you are in the strategy group of an oil and energy business, you may not know the answer, but as of today, you better make some educated guesses. Because all of those four things, both individually and collectively, are going to have a significant impact on the price of oil. I can't think of a better illustration of uncertainty and complexity. Every company in this room is in one of these four states of change. By the way, <laughs> it's a very quaint notion that people don't think they're going through change unless they say they are. Okay, there are still companies that you know, talk about change management initiatives as if there's some other state of existence if you don't declare the fact you're in change. About 10% of the companies in the world, not necessarily 10% of the companies in this room, are in the adaptive change. Those companies do two things, very simple. They first of all make an assumption. The assumption they make is that whatever product or service they provide will be made obsolete at some point. It may be days, it may be weeks, it may be months. If they're lucky, it might be years. But they work on the assumption whatever it is they do, it will be made obsolete. The next thing they do is they ask themselves a very interesting question. If it's going to be made obsolete, who's the best person to make it obsolete? The answer, by the way, is you. <laughs> you, the company. So what they do is they set that what you'll see when you look at these companies is they don't, they're not actually necessarily structured differently. Their organizational design isn't different. But what's different about them is they work on the premise that adaptive change is an inherent part of how they do business. It's a mindset. The vast majority of companies are in unfocused change. And if you think that's a derogatory term, it's not meant to be. Um, what it is are companies who work basically on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis. And they make the assumption that you know, if we get through today, we, we've earned the right to turn up tomorrow. Now, there are some very famous companies in this category, and the companies have been around for a long, long time. They may or may not have a strategy. It may or may not be coherent. It may or may not be well communicated and or well understood. But at some point, particularly in the last 20 years, what's happening to these companies is that the speed of change and the magnitude of change is beginning to affect them. The airline industry bears absolutely no resemblance to what it looked like 20 years ago. Neither does the oil and energy business. Most people now don't go to a travel agency to book their holiday. They do it online. And so on and so on and so on. So what happens eventually when you're in the unfocused change is that something, goes, something happens that causes you now to have to think about making a change. So what do you do? You go to the change management experts, the McKinsey's, the Bain's, the BCG's, the Deloitte's. 
And this is an industry that's evolved over the last 35 to 40 years. Everything we know about change, by the way, we've known for over 25 years. I can show you books that were written in the 80s and 90s that have all the content that today's books have today. What we're very good at is regurgitating it, relaunching it, rebranding it, recoloring it. It's the same stuff. Which does leave you with a very interesting question. If that's true, and we hire reasonably bright or very bright people, why is it the change in terms of its success rate seldom climbs above about 25%? And the reason is, is because what happens when you go into a change management initiative, more often than not, is you actually address the symptoms, not the fundamental causes. So when you've gone through your change, i.e. the corrective change, what ends up happening is you get put back in the unfocused change. Um, and there are companies that have existed for 50 years that simply revolve around those two. Now, the problem is that shock change, in terms of its impact, really didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. Uh, not, it wasn't totally absent, but its impact is much, much greater. Um, in the US, 9-11, anyone in New York on 9-11? I was about a mile away from the World Trade Center when it happened. A profound effect on the psychology of the Americans. Okay, the 2008 financial crisis, uh, the Ebola pandemic. By the way, I was with a conference with Save the Children. If Ebola was easily passed on, it's not, despite all the scaremongering. If it was as easily passed on as SARS, um, in the time it took to identify and do something about it, over 100 million people would have flown in and out of West Africa. Which, as I said, thankfully, is not that easy to pass on. Otherwise, we'd have had a very interesting problem. Everyone in the room is going to tell me that their company is actually quite good at change. Okay? And I'm willing to accept that at face value, and then I'm going to prove you wrong. So. About 150 years ago, if you were in the game of change, you'd have worked out as a member of the Lakota Indian tribe that if you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is actually to get off. Okay, should be fairly obvious. Here's some of the modern day alternatives. The laughter, by the way, is in direct relationship to the number of things you actually do in your company. <laughs> and I always know when you've got to the end, because it's the last one's the funniest one. <laughs> We're not actually quite as good at change as we think we are. Uh, and if you do nothing else for the next three years in terms of talent management, if that's your primary responsibility, you might want to look at just exactly how good is your company at change. I mentioned paradigm shifts. This is the... This is the kicker. This is the thing that's really going to start grabbing, grabbing people's imagination. So on the left-hand side, you have businesses which, at some stage in their history, dominated their industry. Okay? Uh, on the right-hand side, you have companies that looked at the ones on the left and said, if we compete against the rules against which these people play, we will get absolutely slaughtered. <coughs> so what are we going to do? We're actually going to change the rules of the game. And the fact we may not have too much uh, experience in that industry actually helps us, because then we don't have preconceived ideas. We can go in with a blank piece of paper. To the week before Borders actually went bankrupt, they still believed, despite what Amazon was doing, that the only place to sell books was in bookshops. Okay, to the week in which they went bankrupt. You may wonder what the DHL, UPS, Amazon one is. I'm just going to concentrate on these bottom two. By the way, I noticed there might be someone in Tesco's in the audience. Is there someone in Tesco's in the audience? You, you can admit to it. I'm not going to say anything nasty, I promise you. I just might want to ask you to comment on what basically what I'm going to say. Not this last Christmas, Christmas 2013. At about midday on Christmas Eve, the orders on Amazon spiked. Most cynics argue it was most men realizing they hadn't bought their wives or their girlfriends a Christmas present. Uh, but seriously, if you looked at what happened on Amazon between about midday and 5 o'clock, the orders went through the roof. Interesting psychology about online shopping. Just because you can do it virtually doesn't mean the delivery is virtual. <laughs> and of course, what happened was <laughs> most of those presents didn't arrive till either you know, the 29th, 30th, or in fact the first week in January. Um, now, what Bessos did very cleverly was to blame UPS, which is his carrier, which was a little unfair. But more importantly, what's Amazon done since then? Anybody know? They've, they've bought a drone company. 
they bought a drone company. What they're planning is that basically um, anything up to about 30 pounds in weight, which is most things that Amazon delivers, you'll put into a drone, you'll have a receiver not done like your sort of satellite TV receiver, and they'll deliver it to you within minutes of you ordering it. Now, at the moment, the FAA has a slight problem with that. Um, but Bessos has a habit of getting what he wants. So if you own, say, a million delivery vans between UPS and DHL, and Bessos has now bought a drone company, here's a question for you. What's your strategy in the next three to five years? He, you can take the, the view that says he's not going to get away with this. Okay, If you take that view and you get it wrong, boy, are you in trouble in three to five years' time. And by the way, for those who don't think he's got a chance of doing it, he's already piloting it in Dubai and in one of the states in Canada, which is as close as he can get to the US environment without upsetting the FAA. I have a feeling he'll get, get it through at some stage. I don't quite know how, don't quite know when. If I did, I'd make a lot of money, but he'll get it through. Paradigms can sometimes happen, even though the evidence has been around for a long time. Anyone that's lived in continental Europe will know that Oldie and Little are not new. Okay, they've been around a long time. What's new is they decided to enter the UK market as discounters. Now, if you've been following the Tesco saga, and by the way, I'm not picking on Tesco. I mean, this could be Sainsbury's or Morrison's or Asda. The issue is, how do you respond? And what Tesco's has done, based purely on what I read in the papers, because they haven't hired me to help them, um, <coughs> is three things. They're closing down their final salary pension scheme, not exactly designed to make them popular. They're closing down a second head office, um, and they're going to close 41 stores, least profitable stores in the UK. A classic response to the symptoms, not the problem. It's going to generate about 280 million, I'm reliably informed. And you can see already from the advertising, it's going to be put into discounting. Here's the question. When the 280 million is gone, what's plan B? Because Aldi and Little are still going to be around, and they're still going to be discounting. And it's a classic example of if you're not careful and you respond, by the way, you end up responding to the symptoms, not the causes. The, the bottom line for Tesco is it's got to decide who does it want to be in two years' time. And certainly long before it spends the 280 million. Okay, It's somehow got to define itself in the market such that it'll reinvent a customer base. If all it does is try to out-discount the discounters, it's going to have a problem. Now, I said earlier about you're all good at change, okay? And I also said that talent management makes no sense in, without the context of a business. So now we're going to prove it. And now I can see one or two nervous faces in the audience. People write whole books about strategy, but the only question you're really asking is, what do I have to do uniquely or particularly well to succeed? If you can do something uniquely, by the way, you will make a lot of money. The problem is it's very, very difficult to do things these days uniquely. People can imitate them very quickly. But particularly well does. So here are a list of things that companies have traditionally used to create competitive advantage. There won't be any great surprises. It's an illustrative list, by the way. It's not an exhaustive one. There may be well things in your company that you use and are not on here. So here's what I'd like you to do. And I'm going to give you precisely 30 seconds in which to do this. Why 30 seconds? Because it's easy. This is what you live every day of your life. Write down the four things that define the competitive advantage of your company. OK? Now there are one or two people looking at the ceiling. OK? You've used up 15 seconds already. This should be easy. OK. If most of you have done it, which hopefully you have, here's a little challenge for you. I'm happy to put 100 pounds on that chair, OK, and I'll have a bet with you. Here's the bet. Put your name of yourself and the company on that piece of paper, put it in an envelope. Come to me at some stage this morning, and we'll put a £100 bet on the fact that we'll go back to your company, and I'll ask 30 managers in your company a random choice of 30 senior managers. It's the same question as I've just asked you. On the basis that no company is perfect, so I'll give you that, if we get an 80% correlation to what you've written down, you take the £100. If you don't get an 80% correlation, you give me £100. 
I should be a very poor man at the end of the morning, but I have a feeling I won't be. Anybody want to pick up the bet? Don't rush to put your hands up, by the way. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. There's one brave man. Good. Think about it. If you're writing a talent management strategy and you can't define what the four key success factors are that define your competitive advantage, or you can define them, but you don't have confidence your colleagues could, then the question I'd ask is, what, what talent management strategy are you writing and against what backdrop? The world of integrated talent management. This is a very busy slide, and we've simplified it, by the way. There's a lot of documents that go behind this. Um, if there's anything that I've done as a growth industry in the last year, it's starting to go to companies and put this template over what it is they do. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I just want to do four things very briefly. Talent strategy and business alignment. I think I've already proven the point. But the simple question, if you're in charge of talent management, is if I came in and read your talent management strategy, and only that document, only that document, would I know what your business strategy was? Because if I can't, you might go away and think about that for two reasons. One, it forces the discipline of understanding what your business is before you write your talent management strategy. Secondly, it forces prioritization. Most HR directors, me included, for nearly 30 years, walked around with basically a shopping list of things that, wanted to be, that people wanted you to do. The problem with a shopping list is that most companies have about 12 functions, marketing, sales, IT, risk, legal, et cetera. If every one of those functional heads did one functionally driven initiative every month, the average line manager is dealing with a functional initiative every 30 days. Now the HR function comes along and says, by the way, we've got six. And then you wonder why they don't work. When we do this with companies, what we insist on, maximum of three, preferably only two. If you were to get two initiatives absolutely rock solidly sold into your business, and you did that over a three year period, I would suggest that six major initiatives over three years is significantly better return on investment than what most HR functions manage. Second one. I'd like you to look on the left-hand side where it says talent acquisition. There's going to be lots of experts, so I'm not going to get later today, so I'm not going to get into this. But there is a connection between your employer brand, employee value proposition, and employee engagement. If they are not aligned, if they do not say the same thing, if they do not look the same, you need to go away and think about it. Okay? Many companies actually have one or two of those which are actually quite brilliant. What they very seldom have is all three connected. Third one, and I'm just picking examples here, by the way. I was with a company a couple of weeks ago who do their, were about to do their off-site succession plan. Who here has an off-site succession plan? You go away and you talk about the top 100. Yeah? Somebody does. Okay. What I asked the CEO and the head of HR was, could I bring the head of total rewards? You know, when English people talk to people who they don't think understand English, they speak very slowly okay, and loudly. Well, that's what they did to me. And they said to me, it's a succession planning meeting, Peter. I said, I know what it is. Just ask the total head of rewards to come. What happened was very interesting. The guy in charge of rewards sat there for about half an hour. They put his hand up. He said, look, I find this stuff really interesting. Who's the next CEO going to be? how we're going to deal with the top 100, who we're going to promote, what the new hypo program's going to be. But you do realize that's not the way we pay people. And the reason I invited him was because I knew that, because I talked to him separately. What the compensation committee was doing was looking at the market to make sure they were competitive outside. They were looking at regulation. Okay? They were looking at trends, all the things that the Mercers of the world tell you to do. The problem is, in this particular company, what had happened was they just separated. And in fact, the succession planning process that was going on was perfectly legitimate, just bore absolutely no resemblance to the reward strategy. Um, according to the latest CIPD report, by the way, how many companies have a reward strategy? Anybody like to have a guess? This report came out recently. It's about 32%. Only about a third of companies actually have a reward strategy. You might want to think about that. Um, it's great having esoteric discussions about talent management. It's another thing altogether to make sure you're actually paying your people to support that. And last but not least, learning capability. How many people here give their employees at least two weeks formal training? At least two weeks. Two, three, okay. So most of you don't. 
even if you did, let's say you gave them two weeks worth of training over a 40 year period. If you add up the maths, take my word for it, you can do the maths later. If you add up the maths on that basis, you'll do less training than you would the number of years you spend in primary school. Now, the classic reaction to that from CEOs is, well, I don't earn any money with my guys having their backside sitting on a seat. Which, by the way, might be an interesting conversation for this morning. But the truth of the matter is, if I'm lying on a table and a guy's about to operate on my heart, I'd quite like to know he knows the theory of heart surgery before he starts doing on-the-job practice on me. Okay? Um, it's vitally important going forward, given the instability that I've tried to outline, that you think very seriously about how you're going to educate your people going forward. And by the way, the millennials, Generation X and Y, um, it's now the second most important thing. Salary is still important to them. Um, but I'll show you a slide later on that shows you the world as they see it. And what they're basically going to say to you is, if I'm going to join you with a set of skills, when I leave you, whether it's a year, three years, five years, that set of skills has to be at the same level as when I joined, and preferably better. And if you're not willing to do that, I know people that will do that for me, therefore I'm not going to join you. I was going to talk about an Accenture report that was written last year, but actually, literally in the last few weeks, the Boston Consulting Group has done an updated version of this. This report has been written from about 2005 onwards. The problem with it being written in 2005 is it was so far out that people didn't take it seriously. Now 2030 isn't that far away. What it basically the report says is there is a demographic perfect storm that's appearing on the horizon. So essentially what's happening is that the baby boomers will have retired by 2030. If you've never understood the definition of baby boomers, it's people born up to the year 1965. So they will have retired. Generation X, Y, and the millennials will now be driving the business. Many of the millennials, as we already know, either didn't enter corporate life, or if they did, they've left it for a whole host of reasons. Lots of companies have poor diversity and inclusion strategies. Technological change, by the way, this is common belief that technological change will take away jobs. Technological change doesn't take away jobs. What it does is it changes the nature of the jobs. So you're constantly having to upskill people to do different jobs. Um, and one I've already mentioned. Why is it important? If you take the top 15 industrial nations in the world, only the United States will be in positive territory by the year 2030. If you extrapolate current GDP for the other 14 countries, they will, as countries, they will be net minus number in terms of their workforce. So if you take Germany as the largest economy in Europe, in the year 1964, 1.4 million children were born in Germany. 50 years later, in 2014, 600,000. If you extrapolate Germany's GDP through to 2030, there'll be about 8 million people short of what they're going to need in their workforce. Now, clearly, they're not going to come from birth rates because that's already dictated. So Germany is beginning to wake up. By the way, that pattern in a slightly less severe form is, is, is repeated across Europe. But Germany's got to find 8 million people in the next 15 years that it doesn't have at the moment. It's got to accommodate them into the economy, and it's got to train them, aside from all the cultural issues. The only one of the top 15 it's predicted will probably be OK is the United States. And the reason is it still has, relatively speaking, a generous immigration policy. So it, in, it actually immigrates enough people per year to just about keep its head above water. But net-net, if you look across Europe, someone's going to lose out big time. Let's go back to paradigms. So now you've got to go and find some people. Anybody ever seen this before? This is the power of paradigms. Who's in charge of talent acquisition in this room? Presumably a few of you. OK. Back in the 1970s, you missed, who was then part of, um, so I keep looking at him in case for timing purposes. Um, you missed did a bit of research. What it did was it looked at the things we use to, to predict accuracy when we hire people. Um, one is perfect prediction. The fact that human beings are involved means that's not possible. But you'll then recognize all the other things that are used. The least scientifically acknowledged form of recruitment is the use of astrology. There are companies that pick people based on, birth, based on their birth side. Do not laugh, by the way. Wait till the punchline. Graphology. Who uses graphology? 
Anybody? Merrill Lynch did when I was in Merrill Lynch. I was a huge cynic of graphology. I'm not, I'm not a cynic now. If you've never thought about graphology, you might want to think about it. And chance prediction. If you're worried about that 180 days it takes to hire someone, don't. Write the job description, find the first three people that match 70% of that, put each one on a piece of paper, put it in a hat, close your eyes and pick one. That's chance prediction. Now, if you think that's absolutely ridiculous, let me take you to 0.2, which is interviews and references. It still accounts for 80% of all the recruitment we do in this country. In other words, we hire people purely based on interviewing them and taking references. The problem, particularly in the US and increasingly in this country, is that references, uh, frankly, aren't worth the paper they're written on. People are becoming increasingly worried in a litigious environment, so what they'll say is, Peter joined us on this date, this is the job he did, and this is the day he left. Okay? Not particularly helpful. The other assumption that you missed made when they did this was that the people that interviewed actually were trained to interview. Now, I don't know how many people in this company, in this room, actually train everybody that interviews, but you wouldn't put someone in front of a camera to represent your comp company to the newspapers without them doing media training. But you happily allow people to interview people without having doing any form of interview training whatsoever. And think about it, if you cock up in front of the camera, it lasts about 10 days and then there's another news item. If you mess up <laughs> interviewing, the person you pick could stay with you for 20 to 25 years. So what are you going to do other than break that paradigm? I'm not going to go into any great detail because you've got some great speakers later on, but let me just give you my five things for you to think about. Um, if you do not have the capability to do strategic workforce planning, you need to. Strategic workforce planning is not about working out what to do in the next 12 months. It's projecting out five to 10 years. Okay. Now, clearly, you're not, it, this is not about guessing the future, um, but you can teach strategic work, workforce planning in about a day in a workshop. Diversity and inclusion will become a key business imperative. Why? If you don't know already, uh, the graduates in both the US and Europe at the moment are about 62% female. We know that for a fact because they're already in the university system. So if by some chance your DNI policy isn't everything it should be, that might well come back to haunt you. I was working with a bank here in the UK recently who freely admitted that they have a problem. They have a sort of a solid mass of middle-aged men managing a, a much younger group of women. The issue they didn't realize was organizational boundaries are now far more porous than they've ever been, courtesy of social media. So if you think you have a problem internally, all those people are going home and sharing that with their friends on Facebook and everything else. Okay, so if you think the problem's that big, it's actually that big. Um, so the days of you being able to keep that problem, you know, within houses were, are gone. You have to secure a talent pipeline, okay? I was interested on the retention question. Zero retention, by the way, is not a good idea. We were all conned into zero retention as a result of the book, uh, War for Talent. Everybody got petrified that, you know, you couldn't lose anybody. Um, Interestingly enough, you don't want to lose people necessarily, but if good people leave your business, what happens over time is you also become a net attractor of talent. So the fact that some of your good people leave isn't necessarily good news. It's not the bad news that certain people would want you to believe it is. There are two companies in the world that attract a million unsolicited applications per year. Any guesses? Everyone guesses Google. No, Google's not one of them. No. Um, it's Apple and P&G, okay? Think how easy your job would be in talent management if you had a million unsolicited applications every year. Well, I'd settle for 500,000, okay? You've got to secure a pipeline. And to be able to do that, you need very strong research capability. So the days of the head of recruitment being the most junior person in the business are gone. Last but not least, think about your onboarding process. There's lots of research to show you that most people think, decide whether or not to stay with a business within 90 days of joining. Okay, that's actually true, by the way. Uh, but what most people don't think about is beyond that 90 days, that's when you're expecting a new recruit to start actually applying themselves and contributing to the business. That's the point at which, they, first of all, they start bumping into people who didn't recruit them, and they realize not everyone's as friendly as the people that recruited them. And secondly, you actually now bump up against the culture. 
So you brought them in to do all these wonderful things, and now all of a sudden they find it's not quite as easy as you thought it was. One of the things I'm talking to a company about at the moment is if you basically spend over £60,000 with an executive search company, spend an extra 10 or 15 to have a coach for that person for the first year. It's money worth spent. Last but not least, this is a view into the future. This is not science fiction. This is a real-life company. I can't tell you who it is but it's in the oil and energy business. There's a core group of people in the middle. It's a $6 billion business, and the core number of people in the middle is 30. It was deliberately set up that way. I was rung two years ago and asked to come in and design this. So you have 30 people in the middle. Everything else is done by part-time, flexible groups, short-term contracts, internships, job sharing, interim management, outsourcing. You can read the slide for yourself, OK? If a business in the oil and energy business can be at $6 billion and run with 30 people, you start to see what the future might look like. When I show this to people over 35, they dismiss it immediately. OK, it really is science fiction. If I show this to people under 30, very interesting response. They look at this and say, yep, that's exactly what I'd like to have happen in future. I don't want to spend my whole career with someone in one company. I'd love to be able to just buzz around the outside. I have a set of skills, I'll contribute. I'll work hard. When I'm finished, I'll move on to the next thing. So I wish you well, um, both today and in the future. Uh, I think you're in for an interesting ride. Um, last comment. If you think management consultancy as an industry is new, it isn't. It's been around for a little while. Thank you very much. Thank